we can't do anything. By the way, you have something to look forward to besides the message today. We have a young lady, Miss Savannah is here, she just arrived. Uh, she's going to share a word of testimony she's shared before. She's the granddaughter of the Greens, and uh, she's out in, at Baylor and um, in seminary there, and also works with the uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. So she's going to share right after I uh, give the message and we have the invitation, so you have something to look forward to. Well, you know, the contemporary evangelical church is the most educated generation of Christ followers in all of church history. Uh, you know, we have so many options, so, so, many op so many opportunities for studying and hearing the Word of God, uh, sermons and Sunday school classes and Bible study groups and TV and radio and tapes and CDs and DVDs and retreats and workshops and seminars abound um, all around us, weekly, monthly, yearly. In a sense, uh, when we think about evangelical Christianity today, uh, the field is sown and re-sown with the Word of God. It's watered and re-watered with the reign of God's truth. But you know, there's a stunning conclusion. I just read a, a Barna. He's the George Barna is the big guy that does all of the surveys related to Christians and Christianity and the culture. And, and, and he said, um, he, he gave a stunning conclusion, conclusion to what I just shared. He said, the world complains, though, of our shallowness and of our hypocrisy. Even though we're the most educated, Christian educated generation of all Christians throughout history. What, what's wrong with that? Why, why is... Why is the most educated Christian, Christian educated generation in all of church history so devoid of the fruit that we should expect to find? Well, Barna says, it's sad to say that in his surveys, and I think he's, he's accurate, the way Christ followers behave today is not appreciably different from the way that non-believers live their lives. You can't tell the difference. We've lost, we've lost our influence. And I know uh, you're like me. I tend to uh, look at what's going on in the world today, the horrible things that are going on in our, our country and our society, and, and I want to point, start pointing fingers, but folks, we need, we need to be honest today as Christ follower. It's, it's us, folks. We, we didn't stand up when we were supposed to, and now we're in, we're in this situation that we're in. We can't blame anyone else. It's, it, it's me, it's me, it's that old spiritual, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's us. Um, and you know, I, I'll have to be honest with you, I'm often discouraged when I see Christ followers uh, faltering and failing and not living up to what uh, we have the potential for doing. And sometimes I wonder even if what I do makes any difference as a pastor. Um, and trying to seek to disciple uh, folks in the Lord. And uh, I'll have to say, some, uh, well, maybe my sermons are too shallow, or maybe too deep, or, or, or they don't really matter. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm not praying enough, and I'll have to be the first one to admit. <laughs> that's, that's it. Somebody say, not praying enough. None of us pray enough, do we? But, you know, on a more personal level, um, and I'm going to be real honest with this, but <laughs> why don't I practice everything that I preach? I try to. I, I trust in the Lord that I do, but I'll have to say I fail sometimes. Why, why don't I practice everything that I preach? It's kind of disheartening. But you know, I like what G.K. Chesterton said. He said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. <laughs> and then Warren Wiersbe says, too many Christ followers are betweeners. By that he means living between Egypt and Canaan. We've been saved by the Lord, but we're never satisfied. We, we live between Good Friday and Easter 
we, we believe in the cross of Jesus, but we haven't entered into the power and the glory of what Jesus did on that cross and his, in his resurrection. Well, maybe Paul hits it right here. Maybe it's because we're still living in bondage to sin. Somebody say, in bondage to sin. You know, read, read about the Eskimos, you know. The habits and customs of Eskimos in North Alaska is the same that it was 500 years ago. And when I was reading about it, they developed, the, the Eskimos in northern Alaska developed an ingenious way of catching polar bears. Because in their culture and society, polar bears provide them with meat and clothing and fat for cooking and tools from the teeth and the bones of the polar bears. But you and I know you don't just go out and catch a polar bear. <laughs> uh, here's what they do. And they've been doing this for the last 500 years, and they're good at it. The first thing they do is they go out and they kill a small um, sea lion or seal. And, and they, after they kill that little uh, seal, they, they t take its carcass and, and they drag it across the snow, leaving a trail of blood. And then they take a double-edged uh, kind of knife or sword and they freeze the handle uh, two feet down into the snow and they leave the edge of that double-edged sword up above it and they take the carcass of that seal uh, and they place it over that blade and then they patiently wait for the polar bear. <laughs> and the polar bear smells the blood in the snow and he follows all the tracks and he, he uh, comes up to this easy meal and after he says grace he chows down on, on that seal. And you see the Eskimos are smart because they know if they use this small seal rather than a big one, the, the bear is still going to be hungry even after he consumes this little one. And so he quickly uh, licks up and devours this little seal and in the process he cuts his tongue on that sharp knife that's sticking up and he licks and he, li he licks the knife some more and he licks and he licks and he licks and the more he licks the more uh, his tongue bleeds and the more blood that he tastes the more that he licks and sadly it's the taste of his own blood that he sheds that he dies. They got him. You say that's kind of a gory story but <laughs> What's the point? You see, the more blood we shed, the more we want. It's like we're, we're trapped, we're fallen, we, we can't get up on our own. If we don't break away from the bondage of sin, it's gonna destroy us. And that's what, they, that's what Paul is talking about here. Let me stop and say, uh, I wanna make sure I'm in the right place today. <laughs> Can I see the hands of everybody in this room that's a sinner? Okay, I'm in the right place. Uh, good. I, I feel at home. We're all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, no, no exception to that. This is a church of sinners. And uh, I don't have anything to offer you today unless you are a sinner. And we've already seen that, hadn't we? In the first three chapters of Romans, we've, we've learned that all we're all sinners. We're all separated from God. And then in chapters, that's the first three chapters, in chapters four and five that we finished, we found out that this topic of justification, what does that mean? That those people who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ have been declared righteous by God. If you've trusted in Jesus, through trusting in Jesus, God says you're righteous. He declares you righteous. Somebody say declared righteous. If you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're, you've been declared righteous. And that's what we call justification. But we come to Romans, Rick, we come to Romans chapter 6 and we see that we're more than just sinners. We're actually saints. 
The Bible uses that term for Christ's followers. You see, justification takes care of the penalty of sin that was weighing on us. The wages of sin is death. Justification took, takes care of the penalty of sin, but sanctification deals with the power of sin. The power of sin in your life and my life. That's what sanctification... When we say sanctification, that was... Uh, John eleven forty three 43 and... 44 says this. Now when he had said these things, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, <laughs> what did he say? Loose him. <laughs> Loose him and let him go. Let him go free. That's what we're talking about today. Free indeed. Free at last. We are. The Bible says that. It, it, it tells us. You see, Romans 5 explains how God declares people righteous, but Romans 6 that we're in these next few weeks explains how God makes people righteous. You see, justification happens the moment you trust in Jesus Christ, and it's never repeated in your life. You're justified. You, you, when, when you trust in Jesus, it's... It, it doesn't have to be repeated. You, you've been justified. It doesn't happen again. But sanctification, that's something else, folks. That's what we're in right now. It's, it's a moment. It, it happens moment by moment as you surrender your life to the Lord and you, you allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in you. In you. you see, there, justification and sanctification are not the same. We confuse that sometimes, I think. Justification is an event. Sanctification is a process. Somebody say process. Justification happens to us once, but sanctification is a gradual, continuous thing that's going on in our lives right now if we're a Christ. Justification cannot be repeated, but sanctification has to be repeated day by day and moment by moment. You see, justification is the work of a moment, but sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As long as you're on this earth, you're going to be working on it. And he's going to be working on you, Brother John. All of us. Uh, justif justification gives us the merits of what Jesus, the, the, the benefits of what Jesus did, but sanctification gives us the actual character of Christ as we allow the Lord to work in us. Justification leads to sanctification. And, and those who are truly born again, the Bible says, are led of the Spirit into a life of growing to be more like Jesus. So if you're a Christ follower, that's, that's, that's what's going on right now. God wants you to become more and more like Jesus. And every time you come to church and every time you study your Bible at home and every time you come to Sunday school and every time you take in the Word of God and you make it a part of your life, Brother Joe, that's part of that process. You're, you're, this is, and so these next few weeks we're going to be looking at Romans 6, 7, and 8. And these three chapters really uh, kind of go together. And I want to encourage you in these next few weeks to read these chapters over and over again, if you will. You'll get a whole lot more out of the messages every Sunday. If you'll read Romans 6, 7, and 8 over these next few weeks, we're going to be jumping into them. And when we're finished, instead of licking sin, I pray that the, you'll allow the Lord to lick sin in your life so that you'll move from defeat to victory and deliverance. What Paul is saying here, as a believer, we have the freedom not to sin. We don't have... Before, before when we didn't know Christ and when we didn't have the Holy Spirit, I mean, don't be shocked, folks. I used to be. At what's all the evil going on in the world? People who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, they don't have anything to inhibit their sin nature. That's why there's so much murder. That's why there's so much awful stuff going on in this world. People don't know the Lord. But once you know Christ, once the Holy Spirit lives, you know, you can say, you have the freedom, you, have, you can say no. You don't have to say yes. Before you were a slave, you were bond, in bondage to sin. Instead of living victoriously, many people are living, Christians are living so defeated lives because of besetting sins. And all of us struggle in this way. Some, some people have even given up hope that they're ever going to change you. But then on the other side, there's a, you meet some people that they feel like sin is not a big deal because God forgives them. So, what? And that's what Paul's addressing here. 
Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? What does Paul say? No, don't even perish the thought. Don't even think about it. That's wrong. Yes, God will forgive you, but that, that doesn't give you a license just to go and live ever how you want to. That's what he's saying here. You see, the gospel of grace, properly understood, does not lead to a license to sin. But it leads to righteousness. That's what he's saying here. You see, remember that Jesus fully and freely forgives you, but he also says something in John 8, 11. Jesus said this in John 8. He was, he was speaking to the woman caught in adultery. This is a lady who had, had committed adultery. Of course, the man too. Well, he's not here, but, but the lady, she's caught in adultery, and the Jewish leaders bring her there. And you remember what Jesus said, you know. He, is without, he who is without sin, let him, they, they were going to stone her. He said, okay, the first one I want to throw the stone is somebody who's without sin. <laughs> and then it says he read down, he's rode on the ground while he's doing that. You know what happened? All those guys, they left. And then Jesus looked at her and Jesus said, where, where, <laughs> where are your accusers? <laughs> she said, no one, Lord. And then Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. And then what did he say? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. This is a big issue. But I believe to, to really understand it, we have to go back to chapter 5 and verse 20. You remember chapter 5, verse 20? Paul says this, Moreover, the law entered, God sent the law, that the offense might, be, might abound, but when sin abounded, grace abounded more. You know, that's the purpose of the law. So you say, if we get more grace when we sin, why not just sin more? Paul says, no, 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 that's not, that's not it. And mind you, this, this second question here in verse 1, shall we continue in sin? He's talking about, shall we go on sinning? He's talking about... Uh, um, Staying in sin and, and, and just living in it and, and, and going at it. That's what he's talking about. This word was used of, of a person who remained in the same place a long time. And it carries the idea of a habitual persistence and on and on and on. Live, live, as we would talk, say today, living in sin. <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of people out there, even in the churches today, that are what we call antinomians. What's an antinomian? It's against the law, literally the word there means. In other words, here's what they say. I'm saved, but I can sin any way I want to, and God will forgive me, so why does it matter how I live? God have mercy. And then we hear these other people in, in, the, in the culture that we're in today that are supposedly Christ followers. They'll say this. I know what God says, but I just want to be happy. I know God says don't do this, but I'm going to do it because I want to be happy. You see, that's not biblical. That is not biblical. That's not in the Bible, folks. That's a lie straight out of hell. The, why, the reason that so many people are living in such defeat in their lives. Justification was not intended as a license for sin but as liberation, freedom from sin. That's what he's saying here. The great Spurgeon preacher, English pre preacher said this, an unchanged life is the mark of an unchanged heart and an unchanged heart is a sign of an unregenerated life. <laughs> what he's saying. You see, salvation, being saved, is more than just a transaction. It is a transformation. It, we're being changed. It's a change process. And so Paul gives us that amazing answer. He says, certainly not. How shall we who died in sin live any longer in it? He says, by no means. He uses that phrase 14 times, by the way, in this, in this book. To answer a question. By no, no, no. He said, no, by no means, no. See, he find, Paul finds this idea inconceivable and inconsistent for a born-again believer to persist in sin so that he can get more grace. That's, that's, not, that's not the point. 
How can we live any longer in it, he says. Now he doesn't mean, now folks, let me get the other side of it. He does not mean here, <laughs> he's not, he doesn't mean that, that we'll be perfect this side of heaven. No, no, we're going to sin. We're going to sin. We're sinners. Saved by the grace of God. But it, it does mean that we should experience power over habitual sin in our lives. We should experience some of the help of the God as we allow the Lord to work. We will sin, but sinning should not be uh, something that we just uh, live in all the time. You see, there's a balance. 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John 3, 9. 1 John 1, 8 said, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth's not in us. And we, we're going to sin. But then chapter 3, verse 9, he says, Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born again. What he's saying is won't, it's the word there, sin, meaning he's talking about habitual living in it. And we see this here in Romans 6. You see, we need to grasp this truth. Paul puts it a different way over in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3. And then also we, we know the Galatians 2.20 where Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. You say, I've been crucified. I've been <laughs> put on a cross. With Christ. I, when, when Christ died on the cross, I was, I was identified with. I've been crucified with Christ. Less, yet, I live, but let, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So how do we, move, how do we make a personal application of this sermon? Well, real quickly, let me say you need to know certain things, and you need to grow, and you need to show it. So that's the message this morning. No, everybody say no. Grow, show. You need to know that we are identified with Christ. Notice what he says here in verse 3. Or do you not know? Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him. <laughs> we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should all walk in newness of life. Baptism doesn't save you, folks. But baptism is important. That's what Paul is saying here. It doesn't change your behavior, but it does give a public testimony of the change that has taken place in your life. And you see, in the early church, it was unthinkable for a Christ follower not to be baptized. Matter of fact, if you look at the, book, the pattern in the book of Acts, Brother David, was um, baptism followed closely after people believed. They didn't go through a, a new believer's class and then get baptized. No, they, they were baptized almost immediately if you look at the, the early church. So I would just say today, if you're a born-again believer and you've never been publicly uh, baptized in water, you, you need to take the plunge. But we know that when, once we are saved, once we're created, we're immediately spiritually baptized into Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that. We've been, it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. So about when they crossed the Red Sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And then verse 2 he goes on in that passage to say that that's a picture of what happens to us. You know, in our baptism, we're, we're actually preaching a sermon without using words. When you, when you go through the waters of baptism, it, it doesn't save you. We're saved by grace, Ephesians 2, no? Not by works, we're saved by grace. There's nothing we can do to save. Baptism is just a personal testimony. In other words, bab. <laughs> A believer's baptism is really his funeral. You say, I've, di I've died. Brother Bill, I've died to an old way of life, and now I'm, I'm living a new, new life. That's what it means. It's an act of faith in which we testify both to God and to people that are watching us that, that we, uh, you, we, we were dead, we were buried, but we've been raised to, to new life. What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17? If we're in Christ... We're a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. So we're to know that we are identified with Christ. When Jesus died on that cross, you died too. But you also were raised. 
we're identified. Secondly, grow in our relationship with Christ. Notice what he says in verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. You see, we're to grow in our relationship with Christ. We need to have right information, but we must also make sure that it leads to changes in our life. It leads to transformation. We, we, we must learn it, and then we must live it. We must learn the Word of God, but we must live the Word of God. What did James say? Don't just, listen, don't just hear the Word of God. What does he say? Do it. Don't just listen to the Word of God. Do the Word of God. Live the Word of God. Truth must be apprehended, but it also has to be appropriated. We're united with Him. That literally means we grow along with... We've been planted... It's like we've been planted with Jesus, and we're to grow along with Him. It's, it's, it's the idea here, this, this word of united with Him, it's the idea of, of, of like fusing into one. Two, two things, and they're fused into one. We've been united in both the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. And folks, the same power, listen to me, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and me today. That, that same power. You can overcome. Let me encourage you today. You can overcome sin in your life. Bad habits. things You, you can do it. Not on your own. <laughs> you have to allow the power of the Holy Spirit. You have to, it's available, but you, the old is gone. The body of sin is dead. We're no longer slaves to sin. We've been freed from sin because what happened in Christ is counted by God to happen to us, we're free at last. You can say no. You don't have to say yes. When the devil comes and when sin comes and when temptation... Before, we couldn't. We couldn't. We had, we had to say, yeah, I'm going to do it. But now you don't have to. We're to grow. And then finally, we're to show our freedom in Christ. Notice what he says here. Verses 6 and 7, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. We don't have to be slaves to sin any longer. It says sin has been rendered powerless. That's the literal translation here. It's done away with. It's been rendered powerless. I think of John 8, 36. What does it say? If the Son makes you free, <laughs> you're free indeed. Free at last. So you don't have to sin. Believers in Christ are able not to sin. And in heaven, hallelujah, hallelujah, we will not be able to sin when we get there, hallelujah. <laughs> but the key to all this is that born-again believers have been united with Christ. You, are, you have been united with Jesus Christ, and because of our sins, we have all... We know we've all struck out spiritually, but Jesus has wrapped his arms around us so that what he has experienced, we have his, this word here, know, that I was talking about, is, is a word that doesn't mean know up here. It means experience it. In other words, when Jesus was on that cross, we use a baseball analogy. <laughs> he hit it out of the park, folks. He, he hit it out of the park and he, br he brought us safely home. But in the meantime, we enjoy victory because of what he has done for us. So I'll just close by saying these three words. What, what's, what's three things we need to do today as we close? Believe. If you haven't believed, believe. Reckon yourselves dead to be seen. Believe it. If you haven't been baptized, be baptized. If you haven't been immersed in water, given a person personal testimony of your life in Christ and then behave. <laughs> behave like a Christ follower. Live like a Christ follower. Because I want to tell you you're the only Jesus that some people are ever going to see. He lives in you. Paul says be careful how you live. He says, walk circumspectly. That word means walk. I don't know how you walk, but it says walk like this. <laughs> walk through life like this. <laughs> he said, be, care be careful how you live. Not as wise, 
unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Let's stand. We're going to sing a hymn of response, a hymn of invitation this morning. And if you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus, it's very simple. It's not easy, but it's simple. Acknowledge your sin, believe, trust in Jesus, what he's done for us. If you haven't been baptized, I would urge you to come and uh, follow the Lord in baptism. Let's sing this song.